and we're streaming. And we have Quick Change Ed, who now is not in a t-shirt. Hello. Okay. Hello. So we're Hello. Populated. And our Facebook page is asking a little bit weird. Let me see if it actually went through or not. And sometimes it tells me it does and it doesn't. Sometimes it I just doesn't. got notification that it's live. Yep. Yeah. If you looked at this, it says it's an unsupported request, but it's not. Okay, so welcome everybody. It is May 23rd, 2023. And I was on a plane coming back from Switzerland yesterday. So in my brain, it's 3.30 in the morning. So please bear with me if I am not my typical articulate self this evening. Um, welcome to this edition of the Big Hearted Warrior Tour. Tonight, we are joined by our team out at the University of Colorado. Um, this may be a new team for some of you. Typically, when we launch a new program, we have an opportunity to meet and greet with the directors, but COVID and craziness and trying to keep up with things, we hadn't quite gotten around to launching officially, so welcome. This is the official launch. Um, David, you want to say hi and just introduce everybody to who's here tonight, and then you and Ed can tell us a little bit about your team. Great. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm David Raymer, along with Ed Gill, and the, we are co-directors of our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic. And yeah, we're, we're thrilled to be here tonight, um, joined by uh, Luisa Mestroni and Stephanie Nakano, um, who I'll introduce a little bit more formally in a few minutes, and um, we'll be giving some talks tonight. So thanks, everybody. Fantastic. So um, I want to give a shout out before we really get started here too much tonight. It is only through the support of our sponsors that we are able to provide such excellent programming as our Big Hearted Warrior Tour. So a big shout out to our sponsors at Bristol Myers Squibb, Cytokinetics, Embrya Pharmaceuticals, Tanaya Therapeutics, and oh my goodness, who's the new one that just came on? Oh, help me. This is Boston Scientific. Nope, it's not Boston Scientific anymore. Um, their request hasn't come back in yet. Oh my goodness, I will remember it in a few minutes. This is sleep deprivation working for me today. My apologies. I will I will give the sponsors another shout out later in the program. Okay, so Dr. Gill and Dr. Raymer, tell us about your program. Yeah, I'm gonna share some slides here. Fantastic. So again, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks Lisa and your team for organizing. Um, so our group, uh, we've had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic here at the University of Colorado for several years, but um, we didn't quite have the administrative support we would have liked uh, up until a few years ago. So I joined the group here just about four years ago and brought some experience from um, Washington University in St. Louis. And that the timing worked out that our uh, hospital administrators were then again willing to support uh, this sort of program. So we organized our clinic and uh, we're happy to get the Center of Excellence designation just last year after, yes, as Lisa mentioned, um, a longer course than usual through COVID. But, um, but yeah, we're thrilled to have uh, have the clinic going now. And as you can see on this map uh, that I stole from you, Lisa, um, we, we sit right here in kind of this, this open area in the Mountain West, where really we're the only center over, overlapping a bit with the Salt Lake City programs, but the only center for a pretty large area. Our hospital is the largest uh, hospital in Colorado and the number one ranked hospital for the past uh, 10 years. And we're lucky to be on the same campus adjacent to the Children's Hospital, um, as well as the health professional schools. Uh, you can see on the map here, we're the blue dot um, in Denver, but uh, there are several other locations for the UC Health Group, and we work with colleagues in different locations. Um, there are also some satellite spots uh, in uh, southern Nebraska and Wyoming uh, to help with some outreach. But uh, yeah, we, we serve a large area. We have a, a big hospital here, as many folks know. And this is our core team. I'll reference probably a few times that we work with uh, many other specialists. But as I mentioned, I'm David Raymer. Um, I'm a heart failure and transplant cardiologist, but the majority of my clinic is um, seeing patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, you'll hear from Ed Gill tonight, my co-director, um, also a, a cardiologist in the uh, adult hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic and um, special expertise in advanced echocardiography. 
Um, we probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for Ernesto, Sal Ernesto Salcedo, who retired a couple of years ago, but remains an advisor and established our HCM clinic a long time ago. Luisa, we're lucky to have joining us tonight, uh, Luisa Mestroni, um, also a cardiologist in our adult HCM clinic, but a clinician scientist with amazing research and, and um, experience in genetics as well with her partner, Matt Taylor. Um, we're also joined by uh, Stephanie Nakano tonight, as I mentioned. She's also a heart failure and transplant cardiologist, a, a pediatric cardiologist, runs the HCM clinic, and is a funded um, clinician scientist. Pretty incredible. Uh, John Messenger is our interventional cardiologist and really the only interventional cardiologist in the Mountain West with experience in alcohol septal ablations. He's been doing these for 20 years and really the guy to see here. Um, we work closely with Joe Cleveland, a cardiothoracic surgeon, our, our chief of cardiothoracic surgery here, a transplant surgeon, but also uh, the main surgeon in the Mountain West with experience with uh, surgical myectomy. Lexi Tumalo is our point person in the electrophysiology group. She's wonderful and, and helps take care of the rhythm issues with our HCM patients. Dan Groves is one of our cardiologists with um, expertise in advanced imaging with cardiac MRI, echo, and CT. Christy Gamma is our nurse practitioner. She runs our uh, structural heart disease clinic, of which our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy group is, is part of. And then, of course, our nurses, as everybody knows, nothing really actually happens without them. Um, we're lucky to have Cassie Wilkins, Amber Rizzuto, and Tara Gray helping us. And again, that's just our core group. We have colleagues in uh, these other specialties that, that we're lucky to have really on the same campus or in adjacent buildings. Um, we really have everything that we could hope for. It's one of the, the luxuries of being the isolated group here, which is great. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll put up our, our main contact information uh, on the screen to get in touch with our clinic, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Ted, do you want to say hi to everybody before he hands it back to me and I start talking? Yeah, as uh, the co-director, um, I couldn't have said it better, David, so a nice summary of our center. And uh, I'm in my now 30th year of practicing cardiology and bring experience of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from the University of Washington, where I was before. And then I worked closely with uh, Dr. Salcedo before he retired. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to acknowledge Dr. Salcedo as being the uh, focus of our, uh, and really the mainstay of our clinic before David and I joined uh, a few years ago. I will add to that that Ernesto Salcedo and I go back a long way as well. He actually wanted to build a center many years ago, but as David said earlier, the institution really didn't support um, some, you know, specialty care centers. They wanted everybody to be a generalist. And some people fought against that for a while, and then there was a change in administration, and they saw the light, and we finally got to establish a full-fledged HCMA recognized center in Colorado. And we we're really happy to have that partnership. So welcome aboard. Um, I'm going to pivot to my updates and it's a little bit different tonight because um, I have some interesting new little things to share with everybody tonight. So I'm going to go kind of quickly through this and get back to our, our special guests here. Okay, so again, this is the Big Hearted Warrior Tour, University of Colorado edition, and Boston Scientific is on here, but they're not supposed to be on here, and I will remember who the other new brand, oh, Biomarin, that's our other new sponsor. I knew I would remember it eventually. So this is what we have up for you this evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about comprehensive HCM care, echoes for HCM, a primer for patients, kids are not little adults, we love that title. And then a look into the future, artificial intelligence and genetic therapy for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We are going to be ending with a bang tonight. So stay tuned because I'm excited to hear um, that talk because we are all learning a lot about this new space. Not that I'm not interested in the other talks, but the future is a little unknown right now. We have some amazing things coming forward. So stay tuned. Okay. Um, so I want to start talking about a problem that we have as a community. And that problem is we don't have enough of us diagnosed at this time. Right now in the United States, there are about 150,000 individuals under treatment for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That number should be closer to 600 to 700,000. So how are we going to find these individuals who we know are out there 
and many of you who are watching tonight have struggled with the challenge to diagnosis. You've been told you have a heart murmur or you have athletically induced asthma or anxiety or depression or mitral valve prolapse when in fact it's HCM. So we've taken on an initiative called the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. And this includes the cardiac portions of the sports physical that are done for all student athletes. We take those same questions and we add them into the well child examination, which is part of the law in every state in the United States under the ACA and under ERISA based programs. Every child gets a well child exam from ages one to 19. All we're seeking to do is train physicians on how to identify those with genetic risks for heart disease, not just HCM, but ARBC, dilated cardiomyopathy, LV non-compaction, channelopathies, and congenital defects. If we can do this in a succinct way in the established healthcare system with their individual chosen healthcare providers, we can help more children and families get to the care that they need to properly identify and manage the child and the family with HCM or any other form of genetic heart disease. So we've made this really easy. We are stepping this out state by state, but slight maybe change in process. I've been invited to a meeting in a couple of weeks for all women in government. So women at the state legislative level and the federal, I'm gonna have the opportunity to present the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act to this group of individuals and hope that we can develop some more champions throughout the United States. But as we do this, we're gonna need your voice with your state legislators to get involved. So we've made it pretty easy. We have an online system where you can drop in your name, your story, and it'll go immediately to your individual state representatives so we can help find more patients with HCM and other diseases within your community. The process that we've come up with is sustainable, reproducible, and very cost-effective. It is a bipartisan piece of legislation because I am sure of one thing, Republicans and Democrats both have hearts and they both have children and they both care about children. So we don't wanna get mired down in partisan politics. We just wanna make some common sense legislative moves that'll help identify more patients throughout the world with HCM, specifically the United States on this one, but I'll talk worldwide in just a moment. So stay tuned for more information as to when we're going to have legislative in initiatives in your state where you can get involved. We will need people to go to state houses and provide individual testimony about their HCM experience and why it's important to get early diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> this is an exciting new initiative that we've been working on for a couple of months, but it's starting to get more formalized and I think you're all gonna like being part of this. So for 27 years, I've been speaking to patients with HCM from all over the world and taking notes as I do so, but it was no, not a formal database. We've made moves to move this into a formalized patient registry, and we've got some creative opportunities with partners to really better understand the HCM patient journey and really start to speak directly to the patient's needs in new and different ways because of how we collect information here at the HCMA. We've also enabled a new system called HCM Nest, which helps us, HCMA, communicate with the patient and family community in a much easier way. So if you haven't gotten an invitation to HCM Nest yet, we're slowly rolling it out. So you'll probably be hearing from us soon. Or if you're new to us, you'll hear from this right away. So you're gonna get an email that you can respond to, or you'll get a text message, whatever you choose. And you can set up your own HCM Nest, which will provide you with some educational materials, some resources, and a new way to communicate directly with us here at the HCMA. Additionally, we're gonna be building out this program with new innovative ways to have you share as much information as you want, which means you'll be able to share your electronic medical records with us, and we will be able to de-identify them and share them with researchers in a manner that will help us get a better understanding of what the needs of the community are, so we can help to develop not only new resources, but help drug companies develop new therapies that are directly addressing the issues that you find most challenging in living with HCM. So this is all just rolling out right now. As each step goes forward, you'll be communicated with through our newsletter or through other sources, such as our Big Hearted Warrior Tour, on how to get involved. 
and our research partners and Center of Excellence partners will be able to get involved with this initiative as well. So stay tuned for more information on this exciting project. One of the things we've learned over the past couple of months since we've kind of changed the intake process to be a little bit more scientifically based is we've been asking you questions about New York Heart Association class, which is fancy words for saying, how symptomatic are you and when do your symptoms come up? This is a scale that is used by drug manufacturers and regulators to determine whether a drug is successful or not in a clinical trial. But the problem in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as many of you know, is we fluctuate in how we feel day to day. So we started asking patients on an average day, what New York Heart Association class are you in? On a good day, what class are you in? And on a bad day, what class are you in? You can see the circles here on the screen indicate people who were constantly in one class. So we have a number, two people that are in class two all the time, two people that are in class one all the time, and one person that's in class three. The rest of the people fluctuate on a good day or a bad day, which is very common in HCM. The interesting question is, why do we fluctuate so much? The other interesting question is, what does success look like to an HCM patient? Is it moving from New York Heart Association class three, which is highly symptomatic, to a one, which is not symptomatic at all? We'd love to see that in everybody, but is there equal value or value to being a bit more consistent so you know what to expect day to day? So we're collecting this information in a new way to maybe look at it through a different lens that maybe success to an HCM patient is knowing that they can reliably know the next day is going to be like this, whether it's one, two, or three, you have some consistency so you can plan your life. We know how frustrating it is to not quite know if you're going to be up to doing a bigger task tomorrow because you may not have the energy to do it. So we're hoping through our registry efforts and asking questions in a way that is more HCM specific, that we can find ways to help patients and families live better lives with HCM. This is just one example. We also need to get to the underserved population. And I'm really happy to tell you that in the month of May, the HCM's Health Equity Committee met for the first time. And we are looking to build out communities of, uh, how do I put this nicely? Underserved communities are not just black and white or Latino and white. They are all different types of subpopulations. We know right now that most patients with HCM who are cared for at HCM centers, the overwhelming majority are Caucasians. We know we need to change that, but there's more to health equity than the color of one's skin. It includes pediatrics versus adults, rural versus urban, elderly versus young or middle-aged, the color of one's skin, what community they assign to in terms of LGBTQ and other subcommunities. We need to make sure we are addressing the needs of all communities and have not only educational materials, but resources available that speak to each of those communities in the way they wish to be spoken to. We have a lot of cultural differences in the United States. We wanna make sure that we're addressing them all and then we want to make sure that we're looking at the global community as well. So there's a lot of work ahead of us, but we're excited about this initiative that we're taking part in, which is to address this issue. We are right now, this is from a uh, 2019 publication where we looked at um, ethnicity in the United States, where 61% of people were considered white, 18.5% Hispanic, 12% Black, 5.6% Asian, and then multi-race and a few other uh, uh, ethnic breakdowns below. But if you look at this graph here, the number of those who are white fall below the 50% line in approximately 2045, which is not that far away. And we need to make sure that our resources are speaking to the future of not only this country, but the world to ensure all people with HCM get access to care and aren't overlooked. What works in one population from a therapeutic basis may not work in another, and we need to make sure that our clinical trials represent reality, not who shows up at a clinic. So we need to make efforts to find more individuals from these communities 
and we are working towards bringing forward a program called the All Hearts Collaborative, which will help to bring educational materials directly into communities of color. And we do so in the name of Derek Armstead, an HCM warrior who was lost in 2020 to undiagnosed HCM, even though there was a significant family history. He left his little boy behind, but we're gonna keep his legacy going so that his son doesn't face the same future that his father did. So I can't wait to bring you more information on that as it becomes available. I just came back from the World Heart Federation meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. When I say just came back, I came back yesterday. So in my brain, it's like 3.45 in the morning right now. And I'm really tired. Um, I pulled this statistic from the uh, 2023 report from the World Heart Federation, which kind of lays out some of the global issues that the world is facing when it comes to heart disease in general. We're not on the map yet, people. Nobody's thinking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on a global basis yet, but we're working on getting that information out there. I bring this to you to say that we're doing okay in the United States when it comes to understanding HCM. Not great, but we're doing okay. Excuse me. The programs that they're working on in the rest of the world are stopping smoking, creating action plans for cardiovascular disease, working with ministers of health to make sure that they have a plan to set up guidelines for cardiovascular disease, to encourage people to become more physically active. We're, they're trying to, all, I had a, an amazing panel with health ministers from like seven different nations talking about removing trans fats from the diets of other countries, um, which we did a while ago, but I still think we need to do more work here in the United States. Um, we want to, they're trying to get people to use less alcohol and they're trying to get people to use some basic cardiac drugs like beta blockers, uh, ACE inhibitors, aspirin, et cetera. So we're trying to help the global community understand this issue. I met a wonderful woman from sub-Saharan Africa who helps talk to her community about heart disease and she's going to work with us to create information about knowing one's heart health history and trying to get people to start writing down their genealogies so they know where in their family heart disease might have come from. This is baby stepping it. And we need to get there one step at a time with people like her. She was wonderful. Um, and I met so many wonderful people at the World Heart Federation, some old friends, made some new friends. And there's a lot of work to be done globally. And I can't wait to get started on it. Um, so I have a little bit more to say about that later, but I'm going to pivot to this right now. For those who are unaware, the HCMA started the Lori Fund about two years ago, and we are now actively uh, processing grant requests for those of you who don't have the ability to get to a center of excellence due to financial concerns. And if you don't have the ability to get to a center uh, and you meet the financial requirements of the Lori Fund, you can get up to $600 per year for travel expenses, which would include trains, planes, automobiles, gas money, um, whatever kind of transportation needs you have, a hotel room, food on the road. Please don't let money be the reason you don't get to the center of excellence uh, care level that HTM Hearts needs. So if you think you might qualify, uh, maybe my staff can drop in the um, information to how to apply um, below there. Um, Thank you so much. I think it's in the chat now. We have a project that's running that will end on June 16th. So I encourage you to join today. It's called Drill Dr. Heart. It's actually an older program that we retooled for the internet era. Um, we want everybody to know that having an AED is really, really important. If you are a sports team, if you are a school, if you are a workplace, if you are a house of worship or a community center, each group will have the opportunity to drill for a cardiac emergency with our scripting. You plan it, you film it, you post it, you share it. If you get the most votes in your classification, you can win an AED for your community. We encourage you to do so. You can learn more on the website. We make it nice and easy. Plan your drill, practice it, film it, post it. We all have a cell phone in our hand where we can provide a good video, it doesn't have to be fancy or scripted. We just wanna see that you go through the motions, post it, and you can win a free AED. 
Thank you to um, DeVibTech and to Morristown Medical Center for donating those devices. Okay, we have some printed material if you want anything for home. Please don't hesitate to ask us. If you become a member of the HCMA, you'll get a packet in the mail. If you want additional materials, please call the office. We'll be happy to provide them for you. Uh, Tales from the Heart is not going to be Friday this week. It's going to be Thursday. And we're going to be meeting with Dr. Slash Patient Alex DeFaria from UPenn. Uh, Alex and I always have interesting conversations about HCM. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I first came to know Alex when he was a teenager. And he's not a teenager anymore. And now he's Dr. Alex. And he is one of the few, not only HCM specialists taking care of patients and also being a patient himself. So you can join us on Thursday for that Tales from the Heart. Um, and this is like late breaking news. And I know some of you will be disappointed that we're not covering it tonight, but we're going to dig in deep next week, May 30th at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's going to have a one hour session with Dr. Rachel Lamper and Dr. Charlene Day on the results that were published last week in JAMA of Live HCM, which is a discussion of exercise in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and competitive exercise in HCM. So please join us. May 30th, 6 p.m. You can sign up now and we're going to take a deep dive into what that data showed us. It's very exciting and I'm really proud of the work that we did as a collaborative team. We recruited over 2,000 patients to live HCM and we have a lot of data to share about what's safe and what decisions you might want to stop and think about before you agree to do competitive athletics uh, but we're also going to talk about the role of exercise for all in HCM, and it's going to be a great conversation. Now the fun stuff, just real quick. I, I just recently did a site visit at a program that happened to be in the city of Cincinnati, which happens to be the home of Fiona the hippopotamus. Why would I show you pictures of a hippopotamus? Well, Fiona was born in 2017 and she was premature and she had a really battle to stay alive. And her, her team at Cincinnati Zoo did a fantastic job. Her battles coincided with the year of my heart transplant. So I lived through watching little Fiona get through all of her milestones and struggles. And I was really, really happy that my friend happened to have connections at the zoo and we were afforded a kind of behind the scenes tour of the Cincinnati Zoo. And when you see this fingernail here very close to Fiona's mouth, it was probably a foot away. Um, so this is Bibi, her mom, the, the big tusks here. And that's Fiona, who's three years old. She's only about, what was it, 2,000 pounds now? She's just a little thing. Her little brother, Fritz, is only 600 pounds, but Fritz didn't come play with us. So uh, I think Fiona's a bit of an inspiration. She fought through some hardships and she is thriving today in Cincinnati. So if you're in the area, go visit Fiona and tell her I said hello. Um, we also had the opportunity to visit the apes. This is a silverback holding on to the fence there. And this is me in t-shirt mode and Stacy Titus, who is here on the call today, our Center of Excellence Coordinator. And we got to visit up close and personal with some gorillas. I assure you, it's probably better to watch the gorillas from behind the glass because it pretty much smelled awful there. Um, and this was one of the thoughtful little gorillas who, in the next scene, maybe played with his nose a little bit. We won't show you that picture. And I put the giraffe here for Julie and the lion because I'm a Leo. So we had a great day at the zoo. And this is some photos from the World Heart Federation where I took part in the Rare Disease Forum talking about HCM, hyper, uh, I'm sorry, hypercholesterolemia and pulmonary hypertension and how we can get those messages out in the world a little bit better. Um, this is their question of the day. If you had a magic wand to make the world more heart healthy, what would you do? This is my comment over here. Start with letting everybody know their family heart health history is important and to share it with their medical providers. Um, so I was really happy to take part in that, but honey, I'm tired right now. Um, and then I went up to Lausanne um, in Switzerland and I ate on this beautiful deck and looked out at this beautiful water to discuss with a new company that I can't discuss yet, a new potential therapy for those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that was really exciting. 
So lots is coming your way. And I just thought I'd share a couple of pictures of my little adventure that just ended. And lastly, I want to remind you all that the HCMA has a really important YouTube channel with 289 videos loaded there for you to learn from. Please take a moment to stop by YouTube, like the videos, place a comment, and subscribe to the site. And every time we upload a video, you'll be notified. We could not do this work without a big team who is supportive of all of our work. So this is our board of directors. I thank them one and all. And this is our amazing staff and contractors here at the HCMA. I'll let you read all their names. Please keep an eye on our newsletter. You get updates from each one of our staff members every month. And that's the best way to keep in touch with everything that we're doing. And I want to thank our partners at the University of Colorado, our staff, our board members, our volunteer, and as always, Brandy, my heart donor, because without her, I would not be with you here tonight. So I'm excited to hear the rest of these talks tonight. And I want to remind you all that I'm going to load a, a poll right now. So if you want to, oops, what is this? Launch this poll. We've just launched a poll. So take a moment to answer that. If you have any questions throughout tonight's uh, program, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your Zoom screen where you can post your question and we will answer it at the breaks. And I will wrap up there. So please answer your polls now and I'll bring my faculty back on camera and we're gonna hand it over to David who will give us his overview of HCM Care. There you Great. Go. Thank you. Um, so, of course, thanks again uh, for having us. Um, I'd like to take the next 10 minutes or so to discuss uh, really what it means to be a comprehensive care center and what it means for patients to get comprehensive care. Um, if I uh, can reference back to the map I showed you, we have several, we have many patients that travel quite a ways to see us. And um, Sometimes they uh, see us and aren't quite sure why they were sent all that way. So um, I'd like to go through what we offer and, and what comprehensive care centers offer, and, and hopefully it's it's helpful for patients watching uh, to better understand that. So we'll start with our mission. Our, our mission is to improve the lives of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Our our priority is, of course, to um, to give first class medical care to patients and their families. But we also want to educate the community, increase awareness of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then contribute to innovative research to advance the field. To do all of this, we really find that it's best to collaborate with local clinicians to provide individualized options uh, for what's best for patients. Now. Um, I referenced it on prior slides of, of kind of the different uh, specialists that we work with, but uh, this individualized care uh, involves figuring out which of the options are, are important for patients and um, necessary for patients. This includes, of course, genetic counseling and testing, advanced imaging, um, advanced uh, evaluation of why someone may be having symptoms. Sometimes that's evaluating for these left ventricular outflow tract gradients um, or other possible causes of symptoms managing symptoms that aren't controlled with the uh, usual typical first-line medications, um, offering some of these advanced therapies and managing pregnancy for women with HCM. And then lastly, advanced heart failure and transplant for the few patients who end up needing that. So we're gonna go through uh, a few of these different aspects that, that we offer, and we feel that it's, that it's worth patients uh, to come see us. So genetic testing has uh, become a lot easier and cheaper over the past few years, um, frankly, and in large part due to Lisa and her team's efforts in, in lobbying for that, um, but it's still not offered in a lot of community practices. And so this is one of the, the main things that, that I talk about with patients in most of my visits, and going through the risks and benefits and the logistics of genetic counseling, um, offering initial testing to those who are interested helping facilitate cascade family testing for people who are genotype positive or the rare patients who have a variant of uncertain significance and some other family members um, with signs of HCM. And then occasionally we help facilitate pre-implantation genetic testing uh, for people who are uh, thinking about starting families. So this is a, a very important part of what we do. And, and I think it's um, community practices are starting to offer this more, but it's still uh, something that uh, we feel that is pretty unique um, to our group. Next is advanced imaging. Um, and so 
I've shown some pictures of MRIs here. I, I spend a lot of time in clinic uh, talking with patients about the different patterns of thickening and the implications that may have for what we uh, discuss for patients. And really, um, the best way to do this is with cardiac MRI. Um, and while it's similar to genetic testing, MRIs have become easier and cheaper to get, the uh, specific expertise needed for imaging people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy really require, requires additional training and a decent amount of volume. It's like almost anything else. You want people um, doing the testing who do it often and who know what to look for. Um, and we've all had patients that come to see us and they had a cardiac MRI elsewhere and Sometimes it's fine, but uh, oftentimes it just really doesn't give us the information we need and um, other imaging needs to be uh, done or MRIs are sometimes repeated. So we feel that this is something important that, that we offer um, that uh, is best done here. Along with just characterizing or what I call phenotyping, uh, you know, describing the pattern of thickening, we also have advanced imaging that helps evaluate for um, what is termed provocable LVOT gradients. That's um, pressure that build up in the heart of, of some patients with HCM. Um, and sometimes that pressure only builds up with exercise or with uh, maneuvers that simulate exercise. And if you have an echo done at a program where they don't see enough of this, it can be missed. We've all seen that before. With the advanced imaging expertise also comes procedural guidance. So echocardiography guiding um, alcohol septal ablations, transesophageal echocardiograms. So echoes from the esophagus um, where uh, we can get often better images of, of the valves and better evaluate uh, valve disease that can accompany hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then cardiac CT, which is uh, an evolving technology um, and its use in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we're, we're still developing. Um, but again, it's something that should be offered at a program where we see enough of it to know what to look for. And it's not just, um, uh, frankly, sometimes a, a waste of a study. So to somewhat go along with that um, is the specific exercise testing and counseling uh, that, that we can offer. And I'll take, the, take a moment to uh, put in a plug for Dr. Day's presentation of the LiveHCM results. I've heard her talk before. She's wonderful and, and really uh, the world expert in this. So um, yeah, anyone who can uh, join that presentation should. So um, as Lisa alluded to, and, and as many of you know, you know it's a... Uh, outdated recommendation that all patients with HCM across the board not exercise. And unfortunately, you know, folks who uh, don't see the patients that we do and don't uh, keep up with the, the field as, as much as we need to, because it's our entire clinic, um, still give that recommendation to patients sometimes. And so they come to see us and say, I've been quite stressed that um, I was told not to exercise ever. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we do is just counsel about appropriate amounts of exercise, go through the, the possible risks and, and to make sure patients don't have some specific things that might make things riskier for them, although that's, that's rare. We can also provide uh, evaluations for competitive athletes. Um, we can help assess for unexplained symptoms, as I mentioned. And then we sometimes do ex specific exercise studies to evaluate um, the severity of heart failure and those who are unlucky and have progressive heart failure. And uh, we can also offer, offer research studies. So in this image here um, is one of our partners, uh, Bill Cornwell is kind of hiding behind the hand. Um, and he's guiding the study of a volunteer um, who you can see is uh, breathing into a mask. You can't quite see it, but he's on a bicycle. And if I can direct you to look at the right side of his neck here, that's actually a catheter, a small tube going into his jugular vein and into the heart and measuring heart pressures while he's exercising. Um, so this is one of those things that there's just no way a community practice can offer this sort of study. Um, and we're, we're lucky to work with colleagues who can offer this sort of specialized testing and evaluation and, and sometimes um, clinical studies. Of course, um, what most patients have heard of before and what we all spend a lot of time thinking and talking about is um, treating uncontrolled symptoms in obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Again, that's patients with that high pressure buildup, as I call it, uh, in the heart. Um, and really, for patients who have symptoms that persist despite the usual initial treatments, uh, we have three main options in the modern era. We've got alcohol ablation on the left, which many people, um, I'm certain, sure Lisa and, and, and many of my colleagues will recognize these images, but um, the alcohol septal ablation on the left, a surgical myectomy in the middle, and then um, the new uh, myosin inhibitor, um, mavicamptin or camzios on the right. In, in my opinion, and in our group's opinion, 
all of these options should be discussed uh, together. Um, really for a patient to get the best sense of what is best for them, I think you should have an unbiased explanation of the risks and benefits of all of these. And so that brings us to our multidisciplinary clinic. So um, we call it our HCM clinic, but this is really a dedicated clinic to discuss those, um, what I call advanced options for um, obstructive HCM that is symptomatic. So our clinic, our, our group that sees folks in, in this multidisciplinary clinic, so Cassie Wilkins, who um, is the nurse who helps run this clinic, Christy Gamma, our nurse practitioner, again, in our structural heart disease group, either myself or Dr. Gill, um, and then John Messenger, our interventionalist, and Joe Cleveland, our surgeon. So you hear from the whole group um, different perspectives on the condition, on the different aspects that are likely causing symptoms, um, you know, assessments of risks and benefits, and together we decide with the patient what we feel is the best first approach. Uh, these visits, we do our best, and you know, no one's perfect, but we do our best to coordinate these visits to minimize travel for folks coming from far away, reducing um, you know, extra testing when possible and extra visits when possible, and allowing for a pretty long visit, but um, an extensive discussion of all the different options and the risks and benefits. Um, and this is definitely something that's just not offered in the community. And this, you should hear from you know, the experts who do these procedures most frequently in the region, um, and then the folks who see patients who have this the most in the region uh, to get the best information to help you make your best decision. So lastly, thankfully, uh, not that common, but um, we offer heart transplantation for those unlucky patients who progress. Um, we have grown our transplant volume a lot in the past few years. Our, our typical volume uh, is kind of around the 40 transplants per year. Last year we did 62, and this year we're on a similar pace. So that's uh, that was intentional. Our, our program is intentionally growing. Um, we're a top 15 program nationally and uh, the, the largest program, again, um, kind of in the Mountain West. So what does this actually mean for patients? Because I, you know, I think I uh, explained a lot there, and I think it can be overwhelming for patients to think about coming down. Do you really need to be talking about all this? And, and the, the short answer is no. A lot of patients don't need that, you know, five-person visit to talk about all these options and to decide which treatment you need. Many patients have an initial visit in our clinic with either Ed Gill or me or Louisa, um, and then continue most of their follow-up with a local cardiologist. Uh, patients who have well-controlled symptoms or some have no symptoms, you know, we go through exercise counseling, this risk of so-called so sudden death, although I'm not a huge fan of that terminology, um, genetic counseling and testing and family screening. And yeah, again, a long first visit, but after that, for many patients, um, they do most of their follow-up with their local doctor and then occasionally check in with us, make sure there's uh, they're getting their surveillance testing that's appropriate and make sure there's nothing new either for them or their family. Patients with uncontrolled symptoms, arrhythmias, or progressive heart failure, yeah, we see them more frequently. And um, we sometimes, when it's right for the patient um, in their situation, we are become their primary team. Um, and we can help evaluate for these advanced therapies to treat that obstructive HCM. Again, our multidisciplinary clinic to consider alcohol ablation, surgical myectomy, or myosin inhibitors. We have our electrophysiology group uh, to help consider tailored approaches to arrhythmias. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time on it and we won't spend a lot of time on it today, but you know, patients with HCM are at higher risk for different arrhythmias and, and you should see someone with expertise in treating those. And then, as I mentioned, heart transplant evaluation for those that, that warrant it. And with that, I, I hope I've given a helpful summary of why um, seeing a comprehensive care center can be helpful and, and um, why we do what we do. And I'll finish with our slide of kind of how to get in touch with us and uh, the beautiful view of our giant and growing campus. Um, it's the one downside to coming to see us. We offer a lot. Efficient parking is not one of those things, um, but we're we're working on that too. And I'll turn it back over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, now would be the time to post them below. I will make a couple of observations, and that is... Um, Thank you guys for program 47 or 48 into the HCMA family of recognized centers. And we concur that multidisciplinary programs are the way to go for HCM. It's nice that you can get pediatric to transplant under one roof. Not all of our programs offer that. 
So I think you guys provide an amazing service to the community and we're happy to have you on our team. I'm going to give another shout out that if everybody could please take the survey um, at the end of the next talk, we will kind of review who's here watching so that when we're answering questions, we're speaking to the audience. You're not a very questioning audience tonight as our Q&A box is currently empty and I don't typically get this far into a night with an empty Q&A box. So you might want to start formulating your questions now. Um, okay, who do we have up next? Is that Ed up next? Yes, I think the good Dr. Gill will be good. Dr. Gill is helping introduce some concepts of echocardiography. Aha, there he goes. He's not on camera, but his screen is up. So Ed, pull yourself off mute, please, and bring your camera up. But we lost your screen. There, okay. Now we have your camera and you're off mute, but we lost your screen. So if you want to reshare your slides. Okay, there we go. And let's just go into display mode and you're good to go. Fantastic. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, thanks everyone for this opportunity to talk to patients about what we look for on these echocardiograms. And I think that. <clears throat> I want to reiterate what David said. So we offer at all of our center of excellences throughout the United States, but uh, particularly at ours, um, particular advanced imaging and particularly we focus on echocardiography and echocardiography is usually the screening exam that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have been identified with. And there are a lot of nuances to doing a good job with imaging patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by echocardiography. And I'm going to point out some of those very unique aspects that we look for. So here's an example, a classic example of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that has all of the classic findings that we look for. Um, first of all, a hypertrophied septum, that is the muscle is thick in the septum. Um, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, that is the mitral valve, as you can see here, is moving forward with systole. Um, next, there is some mitral regurgitation, this small jet here. And another example of systolic anterior motion. So it's important um, as we do these echoes that we actually are able to distinguish mitral regurgitation shown here from left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which the hint is that there is all this multicolored flow, which means um, aliasing flow and turbulent flow in the left ventricular outflow tract. And how do we do that? We measure the so-called gradient or level of obstruction as shown here by Doppler. And the Doppler has a very characteristic um, component that it looks like a dagger. And so a late peaking gradient is typical of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And here we are showing a couple of examples of, first on the left, the same thing that I just showed you, just emphasizing it a bit more. So here our Doppler sample volume, if you will, is placed in the left ventricular outflow track. And the way that we do that is this small little circle is placed so that it is focused on the left ventricular outflow track but we want to make sure that we're not getting levels of obstruction seen somewhere else. And I'll get back to that in a moment. And here's an example at rest and then with Valsalva. Often with Valsalva exams, we get much higher gradients that we, other, that we otherwise would not have identified um, without doing that maneuver. And I want to just show a, a brief case that we recently published uh, where we actually were able to improve mitral regurgitation with alcohol septal ablation. And so what we're seeing on the left here is this very brilliant multicolored jet in the left atrium emanating from the mitral valve, indicative of severe mitral regurgitation pre-alcohol septal ablation and then post-alcohol ablation we have virtually no mitral regurgitation. And that uh, is shown once again here.
and in a different view. So I was showing you from the apical view, this is our so-called parasternal long view with the mitral valve shown here, the aortic valve, the left ventricle. And again, all of this is mitral regurgitation and post-alcohol septal ablation. We completely removed the mitral regurgitation. And this was this publication um, led by our colleague, Mike Morcos, the treatment of severe left ventricular alpha tract obstruction and mitral regurgitation with alcohol septal ablation. Here are some examples of Doppler flow. And here we have a massive gradient in the left ventricular alpha tract, um, but that is different. And the waveform is much different than another waveform with even higher velocity, which is the mitral regurgitation. So I show this to emphasize that one of the errors that is sometimes made doing echocardiography in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is confusing mitral regurgitation with left ventricular alpha tract obstruction. And it's not unusual for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to have their gradient or level of obstruction to flow overestimated because labs that are less experienced with looking at that measure the mitral regurgitation jet. And here's our patient once again um, with left ventricular alpha tract obstruction. One of the things that is shown here is the systolic anterior motion. But what I wanted to show in this slide, this picture is this is actually doing the alcohol septal ablation. And what you see is alcohol injected into the septum shown by 3D echo. And then the two reference two-dimensional images, again, showing the classic brightness of the septum that is caused by us injecting alcohol into the septum, again, causing a controlled um, injury to the myocardium, which results in two things. Um, one, the myocardium not contracting as well, uh, and then also some reduction of the actual tissue by shrinking due to scarring. Now, not all patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have gradients. Uh, and here's a classic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient with no gradient. And uh, again, as shown here, this patient has septal thickening. They have some very minor systolic anterior motion of their valve. It's actually mostly in the cord, but this patient has no obstruction. This patient has early signs of diastolic dysfunction, uh, as shown here by reduced velocity of their septum as measured by tissue Doppler. Hey, Ed, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. at least on my screen, it's not, uh, hasn't advanced the images. Hasn't I'm seeing alcohol septal ablation now. You want to go back a slide and find a slide and we'll... So here's the alcohol septal ablation. Um, gee, a okay, I see classic patients with no gradient. And so here's classic patient with no gradient. Mm -hmm. Go ahead again. I can I could see it on my screen, David. I don't know if maybe okay. your technology just held up a little bit. So now we're at apical variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Is that is everyone seeing that? I'm seeing so now I'm back to classic HCM patient with no gradient. And apical variant is there now. Okay. So maybe there's a slight lag. Yeah, there might be a lag. I think we're good though. Okay. Thanks, David. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for slowing me down perhaps here. Um, anyway, so here, not all patients have hypertrophy of their septum. Um, there is the so-called apical variant, and this is a so-called spade sign where we inject contrast into the ventricle, the left ventricle, and we have contrast here, and the hypertrophy in these types of patients uh, is at the apex. And so what we see is the spade that is caused by the cavity being particularly small at the apex and the myocardium, the heart muscle being particularly thickened there. The thing that you need to watch out for for patients that have the apical variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is they are prone to develop apical aneurysms. And that in itself is an indication for 
um, internal cardio defibrillators or ICDs. Slide still advancing okay, Lisa? Looks see great. I see near apex, at apex, clear apical view. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So these patients, you need to look particularly closely at their apex. And so this is a particular skill uh, of sonographers. And we recently did a program where we educated sonographers of how to particularly look at the apex because sometimes these aneurysms, particularly shown here in this apical view, are missed. And there are two ways to look at that. One is to cone down in the short axis view. Here is near the apex, you see no aneurysm. And then actually at the apex, we're seeing the aneurysm. And so this is a cross-sectional cut of this view showing the apical aneurysm. And you can see in this particular patient, like most HCM patients, they're very hyperdynamic in most of their ventricle, but out at the apex, there is no contractility and that area is aneurysmal. Here we add contrast to the picture and we can see that, uh, again, the apical aneurysm and we see sluggish flow in this area of the heart. Here's a slightly different apical variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This patient has really massive hypertrophy. And I wanna point out the fact that you cannot see an apical aneurysm in this view, but yet the patient does have that. And as we look closer, the aneurysm comes into view. So it's hiding in the left picture and suddenly present in the right picture. And finally, in the strain picture in the far right, we show that the strain is markedly abnormal. So normal strain should be essentially greater than minus 18, and the strain in this case is only minus seven. So even though it appears that the heart is contracting very strongly, the actual strain is actually remarkably low. As I mentioned, distinguishing an LVOT gradient from mitral regurgitation, a few tricks that we use for doing that. Here's a patient who has LVOT obstruction as demonstrated by the turbulence in the left ventricle outflow tract, uh, but they also have mitral regurgitation. So three tricks that we use. One is to look at the aortic valve to make sure there isn't an aortic valve gradient here. We place the Doppler transducer such that it is going across the interventricular septum. We're not seeing the outflow tract. We're only seeing the aortic valve. So this is showing a lowish gradient across the aortic valve as opposed to mitral regurgitation shown in the middle slide. You can see that the mitral regurgitation is wider and has a different characteristic than the aortic valve tracing which is yet still different from the tracing from the left ventricular outflow tract. So these are very uh, actual advanced level aortic um, mitral and LVOT velocities shown here, but only to show that there takes a fair amount of expertise to distinguish all three of those different flows. I'll close here with talking about some mimickers of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So one of the more classic one is athlete's heart. And so patients that have athlete's heart can have concentric left ventricular hypertrophy that is thickening of the muscle throughout the heart. More classically, it is not so distinguished as having hypertrophy of the muscle, but just the cavity being large. And But despite all that, these patients have normal diastolic function as opposed to patients with Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy typically have asymmetric LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy. Their LV cavities are small, and they have a variety of mitral valve abnormalities, which patients with athlete's heart should not have, including mitral regurgitation, systolic anterior motion, and again, the LVOT obstruction, uh, potentially secondary to systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Here actually is a patient with athlete's heart. Um, this actually is a professional athlete. And 
this heart is characterized by not a small cavity, but rather a very large cavity, large diameter, in this case, 6.4 centimeters with the normal shown here, smaller than that. Remarkably high strain rate. So again, the normal is greater than minus 18. The higher the number, the better. This patient has supernormal strain. And you can see um, the strain pattern here. Um, red is good, and this patient has red throughout their myocardium. So again, minus 23, one of the highest numbers I've ever seen. Their diastolic parameters are super normal. So their early diastolic filling, as shown here, is very rapid. And then again, showing some of the velocity of their muscle. I showed you a patient who had very mild hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but their velocity of their muscle was mildly reduced. But in this case, this patient has super normal velocity of their muscles, um, normal being like 10, and this patient has numbers in the greater than 20 range. So here's some examples of one of the other big mimickers of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is amyloid. These patients can have thick muscles. Um, they typically don't have uh, outflow tract obstruction. Um, they both have diastolic dysfunction. Again, amyloid typically doesn't have outflow tract obstruction, whereas hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does. Um, but the two have very characteristic difference to their strain pattern, with amyloid having characteristic pattern of cherry on top and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy having reduced values in the septum. So here's the cherry on top pattern. So the apex is cherry colored, if you will, and then the rest of the heart is much lighter, indicating the rest of the heart is not contracting nearly as well as the apex is. And then just to look at all of the different patterns that we might see, so here's a healthy control. Here's a patient with hypertension. So some areas of decreased strain, patient with cardiac amyloidosis, again with the cherry on top pattern, the apex being very red, uh, normal, but the base is being abnormal. And then finally, the patient with hypertense, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, their septum is typically abnormal. Uh, with the rest of the heart being hyperdynamic. Fabriz is another uh, mimicker of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see the difference, again, is that both have typically increased wall thickness, um, but Fabriz typically does not have outflow tract obstruction, but it can. Uh, diastolic dysfunction present in both. And the big thing that is different is the thinned basal posterior wall is characteristic of Fabry's disease and uh, not present in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hyperdynamic versus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, typically, they don't have outflow tract obstruction. Hypertension, um, typically don't have outflow tract obstruction. And finally, subavular membrane versus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, these patients have a subaortic membrane, and because of that, they have a fixed obstruction as opposed to dynamic obstruction from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So that summarizes several mimickers of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that makes our job very challenging from day to day in terms of distinguishing a patient who truly has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus some other problem. So ending there, Lisa. I, I, I saw that, but there was not a conclusion slide, so I didn't come on quite as fast. <laughs> so um, real quickly before we get to questions, and now would be a great time to post your questions. I just wanted to let you know who was watching us tonight, who's joined us for this program. <clears throat> so we have 29% of our individuals coming from the Northeast, 10% from the Southeast, 19% from the Southwest, 5% from the Midwest, and 38% from the West. 62% are patients, 10% are patients and also have a family member diagnosed, 5% are a family member, 5% are medical providers, 19% are from industry. Okay, of those who are here, multiple choice, 29% uh, were diagnosed in the last two years, 71% are on medication, 
29% have an ICD, 29% have had an alcohol septal ablation or myectomy, 38% are an AFib, 24% have lost a family member. I'm the only transplant here tonight. 43% um, have had genetic testing. And right now we have 5% are considering septal reduction but have not done it yet. And 14% are considering a new medication or device at this time. So some people might be considered to be shopping a little bit tonight, some answers and some information. So that's who's with us this evening. And I'm going to get rid of this little piece here. And next we're gonna talk about our, our littles. And they're not little grownups, they're little littles. So uh, Stephanie, um, I'm just bad with names when I'm tired. Nakona, so sorry, Dr. Nakona. Um, remember, it's like four o'clock in the morning for me right now. So I'm doing pretty, look, look how glassy the eyes are today. Pretty <laughs> bad people. Um, so we're going to talk about the littles today. So off to you and on to slide share. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Make sure we're up. Good to go. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you again, Lisa, and um, for the team at the uh, at the big hospital, I guess I'll call it, um, for uh, including me in this set of talks. I think um, all of our families um, come in, you know, kind of deer in the headlights, um, not really knowing what to expect. And I think um, these videos and all the educational information um, has been really great to be able to refer uh, patients and their families to. So um, I'll just briefly go over, um, you know, who we see in the pediatric cardiomyopathy clinic and why they were referred to us, um, just to give some background. So I would say the most common indication that kids are referred for evaluation by our group is um, because of family history. So um, somebody in their family was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They may not have all the details, but at some point they were told somebody has either a big heart, a thick heart, um, and it did trigger their PCP or um, somebody else to say, yes, you know, as a first degree family member, you should get screened. So I would say um, this is a win for us because we definitely get to um, see patients early on in the course, be able to uh, discuss what we're looking for and how often we should see them um, before something um, dramatic or tragic happens. Um, and then I would say the second most common indication we see kids in our clinic is um, there was something that triggered a referral, not necessarily symptoms from the patient themselves, but perhaps they went to a new pediatrician and that pediatrician heard a murmur that was never discussed with them before, um, or they got an EKG maybe as part of a sports physical or sports sports participation, um, and there were things on that EKG that were flagged as abnormal, so they were told to uh, see a cardiologist. And in some cases, usually in our young patients, um, if there is a concern for a particular syndrome that uh, could be associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then they get referred to us for evaluation. And lastly, the patients who are symptomatic at the time of presentation, this is definitely our rarest group, but um, certainly an important one to consider. So anybody that has had fainting during or immediately after exercise, definitely a, re a red flag that we encourage uh, pediatricians and families to see a cardiologist for evaluation. And um, Unfortunately, some uh, patients are diagnosed after a sudden event happens, so uh, sudden cardiac death where uh, they were resuscitated, thankfully, and, um, and then their diagnosis was made after that. 
So this graph on the right just shows how significant uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is in the pediatric population. Um, it's an older study, but still um, we want all children with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to um, survive as long as possible, free of transplant, free of any adverse events. And um, certainly the lowest line there are our infants that are less than one year at the time of diagnosis. And we would hope that all those other lines um, in the future will stay closer to that 100% mark. And so I will just kind of give an outline of um, some major areas where I see differences between pediatric and adult hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. And then I'll spend a little bit more time talking about that la last bullet, which is the risk stratification for sudden cardiac death. So in terms of causes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in pediatric patients, there is definitely overlap. Um, there are definitely patients who present early on in childhood who have uh, changes in their uh, heart muscle proteins or those sarcomeric gene variants that uh, end up being the cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But in kids, there are also, like I mentioned before, some syndromes or um, other abnormalities that can predispose somebody to have a thick heart. And usually um, those patients present with thick heart muscle all throughout the ventricle, and it's not just located to the septum. And um, typically we see those in patients less than a year of age. So um, I think we do pursue genetic testing in um, almost all of our patients. Uh, pediatric patients that present with HCM, um, but certainly our net is a little bit broader and includes some other associated syndromes for patients who present at less than one year of age. And then I just did want to touch on the fact that we have some limitations when it comes to um, testing and gathering all the information. I think both David and Ed showed um, great slides of cardiac MRIs and exercise testing and all things that we would love to do for all patients, but certainly there are some age considerations when um, we look at trying to obtain some of that data. So typically an eight-year-old can um, do an exercise test. Um, sometimes depending on the maturity level, it may not be a successful exercise test and we may have to push that to around nine or 10 years of age. Um, and so in some of our patients who are unfortunately diagnosed earlier than the age of eight, um, an exercise test um, really isn't something that we can reliably get. And for cardiac MRI data, while um, it is wonderful to get those nice pictures and assess for things like fibrosis and, um, and really getting a good uh, measurement of thickness of the heart muscle, um, this would require sedation if a patient is less than 10. And sometimes even our older patients, our teenagers, if they have anxiety issues, they just can't handle doing the cardiac MRI, which um, at our center is about an hour and a half in the scanner to get all the necessary pictures. And then in terms of screening and how often we see kids back, that's really dictated by the natural history of HCM in our population, which is we see a peak, um, a kind of increased incidence of HCM diagnosed during the teenage years. So typically, if we're screening somebody for development of HCM, let's say one of their parents has HCM, we actually see them back in clinic every year to check on their heart to see if they are going to develop HCM. And I think that screening frequency is, um, you know, much more aggressive during that time because um, we think that's the uh, time frame where um, hypertrophy can develop more quickly. 
And then I just do want to put in a plug for family screening and all first degree relatives should be screened by a cardiologist and um, and I say this kind of from the flip side in that we have had some kids who present um, for whatever reason, they get diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We encourage the parents as well as siblings to get screened. And we have found a number of parents who had undiagnosed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, that were diagnosed just solely based on the fact that their kid was diagnosed before them. So it goes both ways. Parents need to have their kids screened and kids also need to have their parents and siblings screened. So then next we'll just go through um, why risk stratification for sudden cardiac death um, may be a different beast than that in a, that of uh, risk stratification for adult patients. So um, until recently, uh, it was really unclear what risk factors put a child with HCM at risk for a sudden event versus an adult. Are, were the risk factors the same or not? We just didn't really have much data to go by. So in the absence of data, we did extrapolate the risk factors from adults to kids. But uh, recently we were able to um, kind of uh, pull together data from lots of different sites across the country and internationally, actually, in order to really look specifically at the pediatric population and determine whether the risk factors, um, whether the risk factors in kids were actually the same as in adults or not. Um, and I think this risk assessment also has to be done um, with the knowledge that um, placing an ICD, which is um, what we would recommend for somebody who is high risk for a sudden cardiac death event, is um, is often the risk to benefit ratio is different in kids. So ICDs in kids um, have an increased rate of inappropriate shocks. Um, because the body is still growing and kids are generally much more active, um, they do also have an increased risk of lead fractures um, from uh, just growth and activity. And then um, in some of our pediatric patients, um, they're just not big enough, their vessels aren't big enough um, for a transvenous ICD system, which is kind of the standard for an adult with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I think all of these things um, made us as pediatric cardiologists unsure of who we should recommend for ICD placement. And um, we were able to um, again, pool our data to try to come up with some kind of risk stratification, putting patients in a low, medium, or high risk of having an event over the next five years. So this was published in circulation in 2020, which is, again, a multi-center study um, to look at what factors are really important when um, trying to predict a pediatric HCM patient, whether they will have an event in the next five years. And in general, we found that there were a number of factors that were similar between children and adults. So if you've fainted before, if um, you've had a type of an arrhythmia called non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on a Holter monitor, if your heart muscle is um, very extremely thick, um, and if your left atrium is more dilated than it should be, those are all things that are similar in adult patients that would put you at increased risk for having a sudden cardiac death event. Interestingly, though, there were a couple things that are used in an adult risk calculator that did not seem to have the same effect on sudden cardiac death risk in kids. So for one age was um, 
had a different relationship. So we see that our older kids are at higher risk for a sudden cardiac death event, whereas in adults, the younger um, adults are at higher risk. And I think that just reflects the um, the kind of peak population where um, where HCM is diagnosed and um, and it just um, it has to do with what perspective you're looking at things through, whether you're a pediatric or adult. Um, interestingly, the left ventricular outflow tract gradient had an inverse relationship to sudden cardiac death. So those with more obstruction actually had a less sudden cardiac or a lower sudden cardiac death risk profile. Um, and that has been shown in a couple studies now. And then lastly, a family history of sudden cardiac death um, wasn't um, specifically associated with uh, increased risk for sudden cardiac death in, uh, in the pediatric population. So based on the data that was gathered, um, the group at SickKids in Toronto was able to um, put all of this together into a real-time calculator um, that is accessed online. And so this is called the Primacy Calculator, and any provider can go in and um, look at this calculator and enter in their patient-specific information and um, come out with a five-year estimated risk score. And I'd say we're you know, I don't know, five or 10 years behind the, our adult colleagues in this and that this has been available on the adult side for quite some time, but this just in the past two years um, has become available for kids. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's a little bit hard to read. I know it's small, but, um, you know, the physician would just put in um, all of these parameters. Most of them are taken off the initial echocardiogram uh, that the patient was diagnosed with HCM on, and then um, also uh, takes into account um, whether they had any genetic testing, what their Holter monitor results were. Um, and then on the right, it comes out with a graph of their adjusted five-year sudden cardiac death risk score. So I would um, emphasize that while this tool gives you a number as far as your sudden cardiac death risk, um, the number is rarely a black and white um, number where you recommend strongly that a patient get an ICD or you recommend against ICD placement strongly. Really, the, the number is a tool that we use to talk with families uh, to give them a sense of what we estimate their risk to be over the next five years. And again, it is still just an estimate and, um, and really, we use it as a springboard to discuss, um, is ICD placement right for that patient? And um, for our patient population, obviously, not only are the patient themselves involved, but their parents, extended family, you know, it's um, everybody who has an interest comes to the table and we have discussions, um, you know, regarding risks and benefits um, and, also other non-cardiac implications such as psychosocial impacts. You know, a lot of our kids don't want to be seen as different. Having an ICD, while could be life-saving, it can really impact how they see themselves, how they interact with friends, how they socialize. Um, and so all of these things are taken into consideration. Um, and um, we try to... Um, come up with a decision that is um, comfortable for patient, parents, and uh, providers. 
So in conclusion, I think we've found that um, pediatric HCM patients certainly have a number of features that overlap with adult HCM patients, but it's still important to remember that there are certainly features that um, differ in the pediatric population compared to adults. Um, and then I would highlight that pediatric focused HCM research is sorely needed. Um, you know, it took us a long time to come up with that risk calculator. Um, and I think it's being widely used and utilized now, but um, things like Mavic Hampton or the um, next, you know, big thing could really benefit this population tremendously. And um, I don't want our, uh, our patients to be, um, you know, at a disadvantage just because of their age. Um, so I think the last point that I'll just um, emphasize is that our um, the care of pediatric HCM patients um, really can be optimized by pediatric cardiomyopathy specialists. And um, I say this obviously biased, but, um, you know, HCM is still rare within the pediatric population. And so really, um, finding somebody who has experience um, dealing with all of these factors is super helpful in walking through that journey as far as um, all of these decisions that need to be made down the line. So I think we're lucky here to be able to have such close co collaboration with our adult colleagues. Um, this definitely makes it easier when um, these teenage patients, you know, turn 21 and they need to transition to an adult provider. Um, that transition becomes much easier when they know that we all talk to each other and have similar approaches. Um, and then again, just having a provider who um, has a consistent approach and experience with this patient population and doing that shared decision making. Um, and of course, there are some rare cases where um, even kids need to move on to other advanced heart failure therapies or even heart transplant listing. And so um, all of our cardiomyopathy uh, providers are also uh, heart transplant doctors. So that makes um, that kind of shift in approach uh, a little bit easier. So fantastic. And I have some positive news to share. If you've not already heard it, we will probably by year's end have one, if not two by Q1 clinical trials for children with myosin inhibitors. We are working diligently to get that done, and I've been having some great conversations with industry, and I think we are going to have a day really soon where we can get our littles into some trials and safely um, evaluate the efficacy of myosin inhibitors. Yeah, that would be great, and I do think um, certainly from the advocacy side, your involvement has been tremendous because... Um, you know, there are other patient populations that don't have that type of advocacy work behind them and um, are kind of floundering. So definitely appreciate all of your work. I, I have been nudging along industry for quite some time on this particular topic. And actually, they've been going back and forth with uh, regulators and trying to get that pure protocol where they want it. So um, it's it's been working. We do have a question. I'm gonna rephrase the question in a little bit. Um, could you please um, describe <clears throat> the role of Dalsartan in the pediatric population? So that's a great question. Um, certainly Valsartan has been um, studied in, more in adults um, and the pediatric um, indications for Valsartan um, are, uh, it's it's harder to find um, kind of a, a pediatric population that we know would um, where Valsartan would be helpful. So um, we were part of that trial, and I feel like um, I've 
although I care for a number of pediatric HCM patients, we've just not had the right balance of patients to, to use it in. So, um, so I think there, there could be a role for the right patient, even in pediatrics. Yeah, I haven't seen, um, you know, the, the studies out, Carolyn Ho did some great work there, but it's not really taken up traction. And to really know long-term benefit, you need a long, long term. And we haven't really been able to see that yet. So I think that's a little bit challenging. Um, so as a child, a couple of years ago with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the world was very different um, in 1980 when I got the news. Um, just as a kind of a global, like looking back from the beginning of, you know, the modern era of HCM, maybe through the 80s and 90s, have we have we moved the needle enough with children? Do we need to do more? Do we need to be more aggressive in our research? Where what do you what do you see? I mean, I think certainly genetic testing, I think, really changed the landscape so that um, you know, hopefully we catch more patients, more young ones before something you know, sudden or tragic happens, and then they present after the fact. But we're still seeing some of those unfortunate stories. And um, certainly not every child who presents has a family history or something else to go by. So, um, so I think it's, uh, it's improved, but we're still certainly, um, there's still room for um, even more improvement. And I do think that, um, especially with um, some of these novel therapies where, um, you know, a person could potentially be on it for decades, um, you know, seeing some of those long-term effects are going to be really important to see whether, you know, a medical therapy is an adequate or a preferable replacement for a surgical intervention. So we have another question coming up here and considering the article is less than a week old, have you had a chance to read the JAMA article yet from Live HCM? I have not, but. <laughs> okay. So the question here will be specifically addressed on May 30th at our session. Excuse me, I have hiccups. Um, so exercise in children, we're gonna talk about next week, but I'm, I'm gonna break this down into three sorry, three categories for you. Should children with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have a standard exercise regimen? Yes or no? So, yes, I think um, what we've been um, doing with our patients even before this article came out is also approaching exercise as a shared decision-making um, uh, conversation. And um, I think, especially in our adolescents, there's so much benefit to um, exercise from a mental health as well as a overall weight management and cardiovascular health perspective that um, I think we have seen the consequences of a number of patients where they were diagnosed at very young, told not to exercise, and now they're struggling with, um, you know, the consequences of morbid obesity and other difficulties. So, um, so we do encourage exercise. I think it's a different conversation about, um, participation in competitive sports. And we ask that our patients um, that participate in exercise certainly pay attention to symptoms. So if you have symptoms of lightheadedness, dizziness, chest pain, those types of things with exercise, um, you need to stop. <laughs> and then um, we also have conversations regarding having an AED um, in in and around any place that you are participating in exercise. And there is um, 
uh, a program called Project Adam to try to get AEDs into schools and things like that. So um, we have those conversations, but I think ultimately um, what each family and what each kid decides about what they're comfortable with with exercise um, varies. So I think um, I see it as um, kind of my role to discuss, you know, risks and benefits, but I would not advise people to stop exercising simply because they have HCM. So I just had a really great conversation in, in Switzerland last week, actually last weekend, it was two days ago, I guess. Um, a couple of um, physicians there were giving, were being given an award for cardiac rehab work and there might have been a couple of glasses of wine involved in this conversation because we were at a winery, but we started to put together the framework for a little dream I have. And that dream is to offer exercise prescriptions to families to teach them how, whether the parents have HCM with the children or it's just the children, but as a family, how to exercise safely so the child feels like they know what normal is and that the parents know what the child can do because there are two sides of this equation. And I've held both roles. I've been the child and I've been the parent. And there are times when I watched my little HCM kid running around when she's little and I was the one saying, slow down, don't do that, sit, drink, because it was making me nervous. Having an evaluation with a medical team around you to teach people how to exercise as a family, I think could go a long way. So we're going to start some work on that. I might be giving you a call, talk about what that might look like, but bringing the families together and teaching everybody how to exercise safely, keeps weight down, gets rid of obesity, diabetes, helps with that stress management and lets everybody feel like they know what safe looks like and feels like. So what do you think about that idea? I think that's fantastic. I mean, I think we do that to some degree with some of our other uh, like dilated cardiomyopathy patients or um, listed transplant patients. So I think this is a population that could definitely use that kind of preemptive guidance and structure as far as um, what exercise should look like. Um, and then I think there's just also the caveat of um, I, I want the four-year-old out there with HCM to do all the things that a four-year-old should do. And um, certainly the it's usually the parents that I have to um, support because they, you know, they obviously are just terrified that something terrible is going to happen. So it's um, it's trying to balance, you know, uh, a four-year-old is not going to be able to self-limit. They're not going to be able to tell you how they feel or when to stop. And so I think that's that's the scary part, but at the same time, um, a huge part of their quality of life is being able to run around and do those four-year-old things. I, I have tried to control a four-year-old. Doesn't really work. Um, and I got two littles coming up right now who are two and a few months old. So um, I get to go back to practicing like kids will do what kids will do, right? Well, I thank you for that input. We have no more questions here. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Mastroni is going to talk to us about the future. And I am going to be all ears because we're moving into a new today with HCM. And I keep referring to this as not a new chapter, but in some ways a new book. So I'm, where did we go? We lost you. We got your slides, but we lost your image. Where did we go? So here you, you are. See, can you see my screen? <laughs> I see your screen and I just lost your picture for a minute, but you're back. Okay. So just go into, there you go. You're perfect. And the show All is right. yours. <laughs> Well, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me. So it, uh, it's really has been an exciting uh, evening and a lot of information, very interesting also for me. Uh, I, I propose to David to talk about something different. So 
to bring to your attention something that uh, is uh, probably uh, becoming very soon uh, reality, but it's still in the future. Uh, and this is uh, two uh, concepts that we can hear a lot about. One is artificial intelligence, and the other is uh, gene therapy, and uh, focusing, of course, on their application in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, as you know, there is a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence. So uh, this is uh, uh, Anthony Blinken uh, talking to an international conference about the importance of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and how the United States should invest heavily in that because that's an important part of the future development. You certainly know also about the discussion that has been between Elon Musk and other uh, major uh, people involved in uh, computer science and Bill Gates that is here uh, shown about the risk of uh, and benefits of artificial intelligence. And uh, the, uh, also the last uh, piece of information is that what has been identified is the need to have better control of artificial intelligence, and that should involve uh, um, the government at the federal level. So what is the meaning of artificial intelligence in medicine? Uh, and what is artificial intelligence? First question. So this has been defined a while ago in 1955 uh, by a professor at uh, Stanford, uh, John McCarthy, who defined artificial intelligence as the science and engineering of making intelligence machines. So one of the most recent uh, uh, and very provocative, I have to say, uh, finding of uh, the application of artificial intelligence in medicine has been this study that has been just published uh, on uh, JAMA, which is the Journal of American uh, Medical Association, a, a top journal in our field. Uh, in which the uh, uh, investigators compared uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, let's say, discussion of uh, a patient with a machine uh, or with a, uh, a, a real physician. And the impressive uh, results were that artificial intelligence, so the computer, had a better bedside manner <laughs> than some doctors. And actually, uh, almost 80% of the patient prefer the machine than the doctor. And, and this is a special type of artificial intelligence that involves language. So uh, there is something that may be uh, positive in uh, uh, using artificial intelligence uh, in medicine, in particular in cardiomyopathies, and in particular in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I give you a couple of examples. So Ed Gill mentioned how difficult it is uh, also for an experienced clinician to distinguish between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other conditions. So this is an application of artificial intelligence to the diagnosis of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy compared to amyloidosis. So <clears throat> this is actually a, a sub uh, a, a area of uh, artificial intelligence that is called machine learning, which means the computer uh, um, can learn based on uh, assimilating a number of uh, a large number of data or uh, also improving experience. And notice how a, 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 another subgroup, let's say, uh, a, a sub area of artificial intelligence is deep learning. For deep learning, what uh, is expected is the machine not only learns, but also is able to process the data without the human intervention. So applying these very sophisticated uh, techniques, what the authors did is to uh, uh, analyze or have actually the artificial intelligence analyze a very large number of EKGs over 50,000 in a very large data set of cardiac MRI over 4,000. What they found is that the accuracy without the human intervention was uh, superior to the uh, human uh, judgment and was able to predict with high accuracy the difference between uh, a real hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus amyloid. 
Another example comes from a group that you may know very well uh, of A1 Ashley at Stanford, which is another center of excellence. In this case, they use artificial intelligence to distinguish uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from left ventricular hypertrophy, like uh, 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 caused by a uh, long-standing history of hypertension. So in this case, they analyze a huge number of electrocardiograms and echocardiograms. And again, <clears throat> the artificial intelligence system was uh, uh, more precise in distinguishing either hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hypertension compared to the human, uh, meaning the, uh, the um, physician. So all of these uh, is a kind of a suggestion that uh, actually artificial intelligence can really benefit uh, and uh, be a, a significant help uh, for the physician. Will it substitute the uh, a physician? I don't think so, and many don't think, uh, like me, uh, that that's the fact. So uh, the uh, intelligence of humans, it's more complex, but certainly for the physician to have this kind of support can be of critical importance. So the artificial intelligence can be applied also for the discovery of biomarkers, and there is a, a lot of uh, investment and attention to these. So again, the point here is to have a large number of uh, uh, a patient and a large number of samples that can be analyzed uh, with uh, this sophisticated technique. This is an example uh, that was kind of a proof of concept from the group of Perry Elliott uh, at the University of London. What they did is to, they took 200 patients, they studied their uh, um, serum and their blood, uh, they uh, identify a number of uh, proteins called peptides uh, that were particularly significant in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population. They merge these with the clinical information, in particular the cardiac MRI and the presence of scars in the heart. And then they evaluate uh, uh, how powerful the, uh, was the potential to predict the risk of ventricular arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death. And so they use both what is called proteomics and machine learning. And uh, they uh, first discovered biomarkers. And then they found that these biomarkers were really very accurate in predicting the risk uh, of uh, uh, arrhythmias and the risk of scars in the heart. So there is a potential there. Uh, this is still, as you can imagine, uh, uh, under investigation, we have now the availability of large biobanks with a, a huge amount of data, like the UK biobank that uh, involve more than 500,000 patients. So uh, this is becoming really an important field. The second topic that I wanted to mention to you uh, in this uh, look into the future is the uh, possibility to have gene therapy for hypertrophic anemiopathy. So uh, this is from the uh, NIH, the NHGRI uh, Institute of the NIH, uh, that is showing how basically gene therapy works. So you uh, have a, a healthy gene, a normal gene, uh, called functional gene that is uh, packaged into the uh, uh, envelope of the virus, a, a virus that in this case uh, is particularly attracted to uh, toward uh, cardiac cells, cardiomyocytes. Uh, when attached to the cells, it uh, can free the uh, DNA, the healthy gene, let's say. The gene is uh, incorporated into the nucleus and start working and replacing the defective gene. So this is the concept of uh, uh, gene therapy. So the reality is that, and this is a um, a, a slide that Jeff Harrelson uh, uh, of Tenaya Therapeutics kindly provided me. Uh, the reality is that uh, adeno-associated uh, uh, gene therapy, this is the type of virus that is used, it's actually been uh, uh, under study for over 20 years. There are 
uh, over 180 uh, uh, gene therapy clinical programs. Uh, there are over 250 studies, more than 15 years of uh, uh, experience, six approved uh, gene therapies since 2017, and there are uh, over 5,000 patients <clears throat> that have been treated. So let me bring you a little bit uh, uh, into the concept of which uh, you, we mean for gene therapy. So there are three fundamentally type of gene therapy that can be used in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So one is that uh, there is a, the mutation that is causing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cause a loss, a decrease of a specific protein. So in this case, the approach is to replace introducing the normal gene into the cardiomyocytes uh, and rescuing the normal level of the protein that is uh, missing or deficient. The second approach is the so-called gene silencing therapy. So uh, what you want to do is to silence, to block uh, uh, the defective gene uh, uh, um, uh, function. And so uh, the abnormal protein will not be expressed in this case. The problem here is that this approach needs a, a series of repeated treatments. The ultimate, of course, is to simply repair the gene. So to, there is a mutation and to be able to correct the mutation. And this is becoming a reality as well. Of course, as you can imagine, this is uh, the most difficult approach. So Let's review how this is working. So you have the uh, a, a, a viral envelope, uh, which will encapsulate the normal gene. Uh, this is given as a treatment, uh, as an uh, IV infusion just once. Uh, the uh, treatment targets specifically the uh, cardiac muscle cells. Uh, the vector, which is the uh, viral vector, arrives uh, at, this, um, uh, at the cells, and the uh, uh, DNA is uh, uh, freed and integrates into the uh, DNA uh, in the nucleus. And this basically is expected to basically repair the heart disease. So why I'm saying that this is becoming reality? Because uh, uh, this approach uh, is now... Uh, uh, a, a gene therapy program that is now in a, a phase 1b uh, study by the Tenaya Therapeutics. Uh, we are collaborating actually with Tenaya on other gene therapy uh, programs. Um, and um, this um, uh, study uh, is to evaluate uh, the uh, safety and tolerability of a infusion of uh, the uh, adenoviral vector containing uh, a gene for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The gene in this case is the myosin binding protein C gene, which is particularly suitable for this uh, um, uh, type of therapy. And uh, adults are enrolled at this time. They have to be symptomatic and non-obstructive. They have to have a, a cardiac defibrillator. So the plan is to start the actual uh, uh, administration of the drug uh, in the, at the end of uh, 2023. So I mentioned that, however, the ultimate uh, approach uh, is to actually repair the gene. And this is particularly important for uh, patients that have the beta-myosin heavy chain gene uh, uh, mutation. The reason is that the uh, myosin heavy chain is very big and it's uh, very difficult to package the gene into a vector. So the strategy in that case is to package in the vector the machinery to repair the gene. So, and these are uh, two studies that just came out uh, on Nature Medicine, so very, very high level journals. One is from the group of Texas of Eric Colson, and the other is from the Seidman's uh, uh, laboratory at Harvard. Both of them uh, were able to show that they were able to repair first in vitro and then in preclinical studies. So what we call preclinical study, which is the animal model, that if you can see this is the normal heart, this is, you can uh, uh, see here, this is the 
uh, 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 left ventricle. These are the walls uh, of the left ventricle that are much thicker than here. And this is after uh, treatment with gene therapy. As you can see, the thickening of the walls is completely restored. Uh, after uh, this treatment. So there is a lot of investment, a lot of research going on to be able to uh, use also this strategy to treat our patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So with this, I would like to conclude and leave you with the, this message. So artificial intelligence is something we hear to talk a lot uh, lately. Uh, but in medicine, in particular for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, can have a significant benefit. Uh, um, AI has really the potential to automate the detection and diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and determine a very specific treatment and prognosis and be a significant help uh, for the uh, physician. And it may lead to important biomarkers discovery. And concerning gene therapy, we are already at the phase of trials in the clinical setting uh, for myosin binding protein C in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And uh, as you have seen, the correction of the mutation is now in preclinical animal studies. And with this, I will stop here. Oh, I had so many questions myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... I will disclose that I am on an advisory board um, for Biomarin on a similar project line, and the HCMA is gladly working with Tanaya Therapeutics on their trial, and there are a few other companies who are also looking to do genetic therapy, not necessarily only on myosin binding protein C, but some of the troponin mutations are also coming. So I'm going to start probably with the hardest question. And I'm fascinated to hear your reply to this. Who would be a good candidate, in your opinion, to be in a phase 1B clinical trial for a genetic therapy in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And for the audience, because I know you know where I'm going with this, but for the audience, there's people like me who go to transplant and right ahead of transplant, probably too late to try to save the heart. And frankly, the therapy, it's a virus. It's a little hard on the system. So you don't want to take somebody who's really compromised, but you also don't want to take somebody who doesn't really have a sign of a disease and only has the gene. So where's the middle ground of who would be a good candidate in terms of their clinical profile? This is an extremely good question, Lisa. <laughs> you know that. Uh, so I have been also sitting in uh, the advisory board of companies that are working on gene therapy, and uh, that's always the question. So we have to start uh, from symptomatic patients, and we have to start from symptomatic patients that are, as you said, not too advanced because we cannot take chances to, uh, and we may not actually see the benefit at that point. Right. But we really need in this phase of a study to be able to measure the benefit. So the patient has to show the sign of disease so that we can capture the benefit. And this is in terms of efficacy of the therapy. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, when would be the ideal time, we all are convinced that actually, eventually, it would be good to act as soon as possible because you want to potentially in a uh, very early in life uh, to be able to repair and avoid all the consequences of the uh, dysfunction of at the cellular level and at the organ level. Uh, so we are kind of bound to select a very restricted group of patients for the study, for the trial, but hopefully then the application will be much broader. And then I think you were asking also about the potential risk uh, as you know, so on one side, as you saw, there are already many uh, um, trials that are uh, using viral vectors, particularly in hematologic disorder, now in cancer. So there is more experience, but certainly, you know, uh, th there is the possibility that, for instance, patients may not respond because they have been already exposed to adenovirus infection, uh, or they may have a very strong 
uh, uh, immune reaction. So this is all, uh, you know, uh, a, something that we have still to study and to explore. So my understanding at this point is there would be a two-level um, immunosuppression mm -hmm. uh, regimen, both with probably sirolimus or tacrolimus or, and uh, pregnisone for a period of 90 days, which means it's not just about the individual being dosed. It's also about those who live with that individual. Mm -hmm. So family members who are in the household are going to have to be really, really careful, much like a transplant patient going home. We have to make sure no viruses, no infections come into the house. You got to watch who's changing the cat litter and all those little things, real life with immunosuppression. So it's really exciting, but thought provoking. I'm curious to see what the rest of our faculty thinks about this new age. Um, I'll start with the adults and then we'll go to the peds. Ed, what are you thinking? So very interesting and provocative talk there, Louisa. Um, you really touched on two subjects that have been in the forefront of the news the last few weeks here in terms of, um, you know, particularly with AI and is it actually overstepping the bounds of <clears throat> what we should be doing, but certainly gene therapy has been right there, not so much recently. Um, but I uh, uh, love your question, Lisa, with regard to who is a candidate, you know, someone, certainly not someone that is not showing any signs of any problems, um, but I think someone more in the medium level of uh, disease process. Um, you know, we've been talking about gene therapy forever. Um, we keep thinking it's going to come to the forefront. Um, I hope that it does, Louisa. I'm excited about those trials. Um, I really want to participate in them. Um, it's easy to be a bit of a pessimist, though, because we've been talking about this forever, um, just like we've been talking about uh, stem cell therapy for myocardial infarction, and it never seems to come to fruition. So. Um, I don't want to be a pessimist here. Uh, I'm hopeful that it will happen. Uh, if it does, it could uh, affect a huge number of the population of patients that were taken care of. Uh, I guess my only comment, other comment other than that, I don't want to monopolize the conversation and let David speak, but troponin mutations. Um, interesting that you brought that up because uh, you know, for two reasons. One, the troponin mutations uh, are associated with some particularly bad outcomes in some HCM patients, but that hasn't really sorted out to be quite as bad as we thought it was going to be. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting about that is, you know, Mavicampton seems to work whether you have a myosin gene abnormality or some other gene abnormality. So that's food for thought as well. David? Yeah, great points so far. And um, yeah, really interesting talks. Um, I think Lisa, uh, you being a transplant patient, me being a transplant doctor, that my, my first thoughts when I was first reading about the protocol was also about the risk of immunosuppression. So I think that's going to be an important part of it. Uh, you know, selecting patients without uh, significant risks of, of harms from the side effects of the additional medications um, and I think we have to take from the prior trials of successful gene therapy to, you know, look at the subgroups that um, had trouble uh, and and reserve those for for later clinical trials when we have more promising signs of benefit. Um, but yeah, I, I think to to piggyback on Ed's comments, I, I agree. I, you know, I, I think the the stem cell cardiology research has burned a lot of us and made a lot of us skeptical. Um, I, I think for for monoallelic, you know, single gene diseases, um, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. So I'm more optimistic. You know, seeing what they've done for hematologic disorders has been pretty impressive. So I'm optimistic. Stephanie, well, what do you think for? I'm gonna people? I'm gonna I'm gonna set up Stephanie a little bit because you know I've been stalking somebody else on your team over there, and that's Matt Taylor for a long time. And you guys were were you guys involved with the Dannon's trial? I would assume. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we were, but unfortunately didn't get to enroll anybody. But um, I learned a lot during that as well as um, 
uh, our sites involved in the Duchenne gene therapy trials, as well as um, spinal muscular atrophy. And so um, we actually have a kind of precision medicine working group where I hear about all of the non-cardiac um, you know, indications that are um, being, where gene therapy is being applied and um, especially the SMA um, protocols are just amazing to me because these are infants who are diagnosed on newborn screen and the earlier you do the gene therapy, the better. And I mean, you're just taking a sad fatal disease and just completely turning that around. I mean, um, I don't think that there's any of us that um, <laughs> can be um, pessimistic when, when like some of those results come out. But um, certainly, I think um, we've also heard um, as part of uh, the Duchenne child, you know, some bad outcomes too. And so um, it's not all all positive and um, managing um, some of the side effects. Um, I think the just inflammatory reaction and other systems involvements that um, happen. I think we've certainly learned a lot, but I feel like we don't know we don't quite know all of the mechanisms behind the side effects. We try to dampen them with immunosuppression and steroids, but um, I feel like there's still something a little bit more there that we need to know to really um, be sure that we're, we can adequately manage the side effects. So I've been talking to a whole bunch of people about this concept because it's, like I said, it's a new book. It's not a new chapter. It's not a new technique for ECHO. We're getting rid of obstruction. We are at a completely different level here. So I went immediately to bioethics, like, okay, what are the ethical implications here? And how do we prepare our community to make decisions on, yes, I want to do this in an early clinical trial, or I'll wait for later, you know, phases of the trial. And I think what it comes down to um, is truly understanding the other risks and the potential benefits as well. It's, it's a scale, right? So if you look at some of the other trials, sickle cell, amazing. Hemophilia, mind-blowing. Um, Duchenne's, promising but not perfect. Dannon's, now here we're getting a little closer to HCM. The mechanism of disease is very different, but it's cardiac. It's a cardiac specific approach. And we've gotten to the target. We've taken the virus, we've put in the package, it's delivered to the heart muscle, literally mind blowing. So I think we're on the right steps, but there's a st there's still some real deep conversations. And I have been talking to HCM experts all over the world saying, who is the right patient? And nobody's willing to specifically 100% say, I know the answer 100%. We kind of feel like it's, Somebody who's symptomatic, who maybe has a little bit of scar, not a lot of scars, some symptoms, but not too symptomatic, not too close to transplant and not just diagnosed last week. So it's this balancing act. And dare I say, we're going to need somebody from the community who really believes in the science, understands the science and is willing to take a risk. And it, they may not see a benefit from it, and that's a really special person or a few people that we're going to need. And I can tell you right now, there's like six people that are going to be in the first cohorts of two different trials. And we're not going to know for a while how well it really works. We'll know some safety signaling, but it's going to take a while. So now I'm going to pivot the question onto something else super cool that I've been working on too. And that's artificial intelligence. <laughs> Game-changing stuff here, people. Like, wow. Um, machines are probably smarter than us, but we have to program them to tell them how to be smart. How do we balance them not getting too smart? Is there a fear of that? Who wants to go first? Mm -hmm. Luisa, I'll let you go first. 
<laughs> Are the machines going to get smarter than people? Yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of discussion about that. So, and this was the base of the letter that uh, uh, Elon Musk and others uh, wrote to the government. So, uh, with the uh, asking for more control and regulation in, in that regard, and that's certainly up, absolutely appropriate. I, so uh, the human intelligence is probably the results of uh, biology for for a very long time, mm -hmm. and I don't I don't think it, uh, that ever the machine or it would be very difficult for machine to be superior to humans, but definitely they can be dangerous. Right. Now in medicine, so if you look at the potential to apply that as a support for the human uh, in terms of helping in uh, optimizing. Uh, diagnosis, decision making, prediction of risk, uh, that's become a very powerful uh, tool, I think. I would agree. I I'm working right now with several companies looking and, and several institutions who have AI reads of ECGs. And then there's um, looking at AI reads of echocardiograms. And, and I'm going to lean in on you here a little bit uh, as an imager. If we could have your sonographer read, just quickly scan, not having to stop for individual measurements each step of the way, but making sure everything's covered, it goes up to a cloud, it comes down with the measurements and a report that says, hey, Dr. Gill, you might wanna look at these five variables because they're out of norm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I'll take the middle ground here and say that it's an indifferent thing um, or a provocative thing. Um, I think that some types of medical imaging are, is much more um, in the mainstream of being um, malleable to AI. So like chest x-rays, for instance, uh, that's already been shown that machine can read chest x-rays much better than humans. Um, but echocardiography is a lot different because there's so many different moving variables. Um, I guess I see it as potentially a bad thing because I think that it would be much too easy to sign off on such a report that you're describing. And I see that happening already today um, okay. with uh, things not being analyzed by a machine, but rather just uh, pre-reads by sonographers. So if you take uh, what sonographers do and then you take another level of uh, intelligence to it, that being the artificial intelligence, uh, I see potential danger, a lot of mistakes being made by that type of technology. Um, is it going to be possible? Yeah, no, I think absolutely for basic things. But when you start integrating things like HCM, like situations where you have obstruction in series, like you have patients who have both hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and aortic stenosis and obstruction due to systolic anterior mitral movement and um, you know LB hypertrophy. So you have potentially four levels of obstruction. Uh, I would challenge you to find any sort of artificial intelligence that's gonna be able to sort through that. Um, but I see the positive of pre-reading like basic things, uh, LB thickness for what's pertinent here. I see that being done more accurately than humans. And so the diagnosis of LV hypertrophy, I feel like could be, that could be a good thing on the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy scene. Um, but on the standpoint of high level Doppler, I feel like that's a long ways away. Um, and I feel like it's a good thing that it's a long ways away, at least right now. Fair so enough. how about that? I think that was a very fair answer. I'm cautiously optimistic that it might assist in a workflow. Um, that that would be my hope for it, that it could streamline the stenographer's time and the reader's time and just help to make the workflow of a clinic much more efficient. I don't think it can replace the read, 
of a, of a knowledgeable physician. But I think the actual table time could be shortened and the time to read could be shortened as well. So that's kind of my hope. Um, yeah, and, you know, certainly uh, I have portrayed the worst case scenario. Um, the reality is that the, for the basic normal echo, I could see that being read by a machine very accurately. Uh, unfortunately for us, or fortunately for us, um, you know, I think that it's probably the workload has become, um, bless you, <laughs> the, work, the workload has become so overwhelming that having the ability to read a normal echo or a near normal echo accurately and not needing to spend much time on it, that said, we're not spending that much time on such an echo anyway, but uh, you know, streamlining the process is already in the works now. They're already, you know, like the major echo companies are already trying to make this happen. But, you know, sorting through what's going to be enemy and what's going to be friend in this process uh, requires a lot of responsible thought, I think. And uh, Louisa is definitely has touched on that um, with regard to a call for government regulation for some of this technology. Um, I don't see, um, you know, cyborgs taking over the world um, anytime soon, but, um, or ever, but uh, I do think that that does need to be kept in check. David, Stephanie, any comments? Louisa, any comments? AI, are we afraid of it? No, but I wanted to mention that there are two questions uh, in the chat. Yeah, and... well, we'll jump to those questions. Just wanted to clear up that. So I'm going to stop. start with the second one first because I have some interesting ones on the first. Um, so there is some newer research coming out on the use of beta blockers, but some of the data is pretty old. There's going to be some arms in the Affy Campton trial comparing beta blockers to myosin inhibitors but that data is not available yet because the trial is still underway. So what do we know about the use of good old fashioned beta blockers on the impact of HCM and outflow tract obstruction? Who wants to talk about that? You can take that on. The old school stuff. I monopolized the last question, so I'll let you talk. No, it's a, it's a team effort. Um, I think the older trials, as you mentioned, that they're they're old now and they're they're pretty small. Um, but they suggested that in a small group of patients, there's an, a, um, a modest improvement in LVOT gradient and exercise. I think in the modern era, um, you know, we've learned more. We've learned more over time. I, I think um, the two pieces of evidence that have been uh, thought provoking to me in the past few months have been one, um, you know, some of the secondary analysis from the myosin inhibitor trials showing that patients often feel better coming off of beta blocker, but staying on myosin inhibitor. Um, and then there was a, an interesting study, kind of parallel, but um, not related to, not in HCM patients, but in patients with abnormal relaxation of the heart, so diastolic dysfunction, which is common in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, beta blockers that, you know, have long been known to be difficult to use in those patients, sometimes worsen symptoms. Um, and then a, a recent study showed that increasing the amount um, of support from a pacemaker in patients with diastolic dysfunction, those patients felt better. And I kind of extrapolate from that, that maybe that's why um, using beta blockers in some of those patients makes them feel worse. Now it gets nuanced because I think you have to find uh, those patients who um, have difficulty in mounting a heart rate response to exercise when they're on a beta blocker. Some people do fine on beta blockers. Some people have abnormal heart rate response on beta blockers. So um, the way I put all of that together is that I, I am, I'm, I'm a little bit more um, kind of critical of my own beta blocker usage. I check in in patients a little closer, you know, how have you felt on your beta blockers? Uh, I'm a little quicker to switch to a calcium channel blocker and see if they feel better with that. Um, I think young people tend to have a little bit more of the, the fatigue, but, but really anyone can. So that's how I've kind of put everything together with uh, the beta blockers. I don't know. Anybody else? Stephanie, can you address pediatrics and beta blockers? Yeah. So, I mean, I as uh, as always, I have no data to go off of, as you know, specifically in the pediatric group. But um, anecdotally, I would say um, 
I tend to use beta blockers when there is worsening LVOT obstruction, specifically with exercise. Um, those with resting obstruction, I find that um, beta blockade does not usually um, help them too much. But then in terms of um, kind of the side effect profile of beta blockades, I think our teenagers are particularly susceptible to um, fatigue, but also they describe just this mental fogginess and um, in some patients worsening of depression as well. And so um, I am um, very, uh, I guess, cautious when um, starting a beta blockade blocker in a teenage patient. Um, again, some of them do fine. And sometimes you can switch among beta blockers and come up with something that is tolerable. Um, but, uh, but I think that's a, a pretty major drawback. And um, again, doesn't necessarily um, change the progression of their disease ultimately. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, we try it because that's what we have available, but um, it, it doesn't seem to be, um, you know, a, a symptom or disease modifying medicine. So I think it's an exciting time because not only do we currently have Camzios or Mavicamptin approved by FDA, we have a pipeline for Afficamptin to hopefully get to approval in the next 12 months or so. And then there is a third generation of myosin inhibitor that is being worked on as well from a company called Edgewise. And there's now another company I've recently met with that's working on an antifibrotic. So we're looking at really rather than the old beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, little sodium channel blocker, um, approach to one pathway of the cardiac cycle, now we're really working on root cause of why the heart is malfunctioning. So I think we will get more specific and I don't see beta blockers going away anytime soon. And in fact, coming off the World Health uh, Federation and the or, I'm sorry, World Health Organization and World Heart Federation meeting, uh, I see that um, underdeveloped countries and poorer countries are probably gonna lean more into beta blockers and calcium channel blockers in the short term until which time we're off patent on more aggressive drugs and, and more specific drugs like mycin inhibitors. So I, I think we've got a long way to go there. Um, in a minute after I answer Gretchen's great question, I'm gonna turn off Facebook and then we'll give a minute or two for anybody who wants to ask a question that won't be recorded. Um, so Gretchen, as always, great questions. So she wants to know what we can do, what patients can do to contribute to research. And I will tell you that the HCMA is going to be rolling out a new generation. I know I talked a little bit earlier about our patient journey registry and how we're using this to help I, you know, bring the data in and communicate out. But we are now looking at our next step, which is a big step and not fully ready to discuss it, but I guess I'll do it anyway. Thanks to the 21st Century Cures Act, there are mechanisms now where patients can direct where their health records go. We're in talks with a couple of organizations on what mechanism we're going to use, but patients will soon be able, no matter where they are, to tell the HCMA, yes, you can have access to my electronic medical records and we will embed them with your HCMA intake and registration information and those physicians who are working with us as centers of excellence and good standing at, will have an opportunity to do research on de-identified data from that data set, which will be a very unique data set. As most institutions have their academic data set, we're gonna have access to individuals from literally all over the world. Um, outside of the US, we're not gonna be able to do the electronic matchup, but in the United States, we'll be able to get EMR, We'll be able to take your questionnaires, your patient experience surveys, and marry them together and share with the research community to, to work in different ways. And then there's also the potential of biobanking so we can get biomarkers from blood samples, et cetera. So we're really excited to move forward on that. This is not a little endeavor. And anybody who's done any registry work has just went, damn, she just took on a big bite. Yeah, I know it's gonna be enormous, but it's gonna be good. 
Um, for those of you who are interested in more information on gene therapy trials, we're going to be holding a webinar at the beginning of June um, on a couple of very specific clinical trials. We're going to be talking about Tanaya um, very specifically and what you need to do to get involved with that particular trial that is for myosin binding protein C only. Um, and I want to just make a public statement because I did not pick the gene marker that they're going after. As most people know, I have myosin binding protein C. And yes, I'm the founder and CEO, but I did not pick my gene as the one to start with. I'm like, guys, you're making me look bad here. So um, I will not be participating because I don't have that heart anymore. And we will not have any members of my family in the first stages of this trial because I just don't think it looks right. Um, so I'm staying if back I, on this. If one. I could just make one comment, I just wanted to thank Gretchen for the comment and point out that she had written that before you made any comment about you know needing um, kind of brave patients to step up and contribute to research. And it's because of patients who offer this incredible service um, that we can advance science at all. So thank you very much for the comment, Gretchen. Yes, Gretchen, thank you. Much appreciated. And um, device data will be included as well. I just don't know how to incorporate it all yet because once you start putting lots of data points together, it turns into mush before it turns into clarity. So we're trying to step this out in a, in a clear fashion. Okay, I'm going to turn off Facebook. So everybody say bye, Facebook.